Hi everyone! Today we're going to talk about gender and the development of aggression, disruptive behavior, and delinquency from childhood to adulthood. We're going to describe the onset of aggressive behaviors and their developmental path, describe the prevalence of disruptive behavior disorders, explain the co-determinants of gender differences, explain heterotopic and homotypic differences, describe the developmental differences, and summarize the explanations of gender differences in disruptive behavior disorders. The onset, the prevalence, and manifestations of, aggressive, of aggression in childhood is going to be important to talk about. So the age of onset, approximately 80% of children show the, age, show the onset of aggression by age 17 months. So if we think about that though, 17 months, that kind of makes sense. At 17 months, children still don't have the language to actually express their frustrations. So they express their frustrations through hitting and kicking and biting. That is what we call um, typical or normative aggression. In the National Longitudinal Survey of Children and Youth, we got some information about the types of aggression. Boys were more likely than girls to get into fights and kick, bite and hit others. Boys at two years of age frequently show this behavior. It is at 4.8% of boys versus 2.4% of girls. So you can see that that percentage is still really low, even though it's more frequent for boys. Peak aggression for both boys and girls is about two years old. So again, that language isn't quite developed yet at two years old. So two years old though, they can start to understand that language. And this is really kind of the peak of where the fact that they don't have the language to express their frustrations frustrates them even more. So cognitively, they're able to know that they're frustrated, you know, different than an infant who's crying or screaming because they're hungry or they're wet. Some critical dimensions to talk about. There's a small percent of boys and girls who show aggression over five years old. Girls tend to improve more rapidly than boys after the age of four. Preschool expulsions are four times higher for boys, 10.5 versus 2.3, which shows extreme aggression for girls is pretty rare at that age. So the critical dimensions that we talk about for aggression include intensity. So what exactly does that look like? Is it just a little bit of crying and swatting or is it somebody who is really hitting and kicking and biting? Reactivity, how reactive are they? Do they result in aggression with any type of frustration or is it only extreme frustration? And pervasiveness, so how often does this occur? Over how many settings, how constant? are those tantrums? Are they able to be easily calmed down or do they have to go through the entire tantrum before they stop? When we're talking about elementary school age children, the level of aggression towards peers is the same for both boys and girls. And there's a specific outlier for girls. So girls who are low on empathy, low on affiliative behaviors, so making friends, Girls who show little collaborative play, little tend and befriend behavior. So typically the female sex is more willing to help. They're more willing to look at somebody who's in distress and feel empathy or sympathy for them and try to befriend them. And those who display longer outbur outbursts, anger outbursts, are extreme outliers for girls relative to boys. So those girls we can predict are gonna have some severe disruptive behavior disorders later in life. And one of the things that when we talk about prevalence, and we'll talk about this in a couple of slides, is that for most disruptive behavior disorders, typically prevalence is much higher for boys than girls. And it's that case in many, many um, mental illnesses in general, conduct disorder, um, oppositional defiant disorder, ADHD, autism, the prevalence is always typically higher in boys. And at the school level, it's very easy to see that. So I have kids across the 
spectrum with disabilities. So I have some who have speech and language impairments, learning disabilities, um, autism, and obviously emotional behavioral disorders. I have a caseload of 20, and I only have two girls on my caseload. And that's typical that each year I only have one to two girls on my caseload. And that is because I do get most of the kids who have um, mental health disorders, regardless of what their disability is. And I do get all the kids who have emotional behavioral disorders. And I tend to get the students who have autism who have behavioral disorders. So my caseload, caseload is typically boy heavy compared to the number of girls. So when we talk about the prevalence, there's always gonna be some discrepancies in numbers. And that's because when we talk about the DSM, we're talking about clinical numbers. And a lot of the other areas, like for example, this textbook, relies more heavily on research. So those numbers may tend to be different. Like I said in the previous slide, CD and ODD typically tend to be more prevalent in boys, but I know that somewhere in one of the previous chapters we talked about how conduct disorder is also relatively high in girls and it's the second leading mental health diagnosis among females. If you're reading the DSM and you're reading the prevalence section in the DSM criteria, it doesn't really explain that. So according to the DSM, conduct disorder Across childhood, the prevalence is 4.6% and it's 8% for oppositional defiant disorder. When we're talking research, a meta-analysis said that conduct disorder was 2.9 and oppositional defiant disorder was 2.5. Conduct disorder, however, rises to between 4 to 15% prevalence in early to mid-adolescence and conduct disorder is higher in boys. And I know what you're thinking, four to 15%, that's a pretty big discrepancy of numbers. Um, you know, there's 4% and then you have triple that, which is pretty big at 15%, obviously more than triple that. And again, this is a meta-analysis. So when we're talking meta-analysis, we're talking about a vast array of research articles, which is probably the reason that that prevalence rate is so wide. The developmental course, for oppositional defiant disorder is pretty consistent across childhood and adolescence. However, the prevalence of conduct disorder, as we said in the previous point, increases over adolescence. Girls have an increased use of verbal aggression rather than physical aggression, and they have covert forms of delinquency, such as sneaking out or being truant. In terms of aggression, in terms of aggression, or trends of aggression, girls tend to have more aggression towards family members or relationship or romantic partners, as opposed to boys who have aggression with peers and random strangers. Girls, especially, tend to have aggression towards their mothers. And in terms of mental health, as I said previously, conduct disorder is the second most frequent psychiatric diagnosis in girls. And that's really surprising to me, reading that statistic. I would think that anxiety and depression would be much more prevalent in girls, eating disorders, um, than conduct disorder. So I guess that adage is true. You learn something new every day. In research, they were looking at determining what the co-determinants of conduct disorder and um, oppositional defiant disorder are. So co-determinants is a little bit different than comorbidity. Comorbidity is something that occurs at the same time. Co-determinant is something that is a precursor or something that causes it. Um, in terms of conduct disorder and ODD, the big co-determinant that they focused on in terms of research was ADHD. Most severe conduct disorder and oppositional defiant disorders also score high on ADHD, which would lead somebody to believe that maybe ADHD either precurses CD and OD, or if it's comorbid, it makes it worse because of the severity of the ADHD in children who have both ODD and CD. However, longitudinal studies show that ADHD did not predict disruptive behavior disorders. So being diagnosed with ADHD does not accurately predict 
the development of conduct disorder or oppositional defiant disorder. And me personally, I think that part of that is that a lot of children who have ADHD may be diagnosed incorrectly. Um, there are studies that show that a percentage of students who are diagnosed with ADHD actually have bipolar disorder. And prescribing Ritalin or Concerta or Adderall for ADHD doesn't work, especially if you have bipolar disorder. And if we think of it, the mania of bipolar disorder and the hyperactivity of ADHD often looks very similar. But then if we look at the opposite, children who have ADHD typically are always hyper. They're bouncing off the walls. They're constantly inattentive. I have a student right now who has ADHD and like he just can't control himself. He constantly has to get up and walk around and talk as opposed to somebody who has ADHD and has what we consider these lows, where they're really moody or irritable. That's not ADHD, that's bipolar. Because bipolar looks very different in teenagers and children. So in adults, you have that cycle of being depressed, which are the lows, and then you have the mania, which are the highs. In children and teenagers, you have the highs, which are mania, but it's irritation and anger that's the low. That rep replaces the depression. That's how it manifests itself. So we have a lot of students who typically manifest symptoms of ADHD. And if we think about it, especially at an elementary level or middle school level, not many teachers are gonna think that somebody has bipolar. They're gonna think a child has ADHD. That's typically what they get referred to a psychologist or a pediatrician for. And because they see that hyperactivity, they're not trying to rule out, rule out bipolar disorder. So it makes sense to me that ADHD is not a co-determinant of CD and ODD. CU traits is something else that they looked to see whether or not that is the co-determinant of ODD and CD. And they wanted to predict psychopathy in adulthood by looking at those who have ODD and CD and CU traits. However, there's not enough research quite yet to say that those CU traits are able to accurately predict psychopathy or antisocial personality disorder as an adult. The next topic they cover is homotypic and heterotypic continuity. And let's define those real quick. So homotypic continuity means that you have a disorder that predicts itself. So does having disruptive behaviors as a child predict that you're going to have disruptive behaviors as a teen? Or for example, does disruptive behaviors as a teen predict that you're going to have disruptive behaviors as an adult? Heterotypic means that you have one disorder that predicts the later development of another disorder. So for example, does diagnosis of ODD later predict a diagnosis of CD. So there is some stability of girls compared to boys. So there was a stability rate of 0.7 to 0.88 for parents and 0.56 to 0.83 for teachers. So remember it goes from zero to one. So those are moderate to high stability rates. The stability of both externalizing and internalizing behaviors was high or higher for girls than it was for boys. So stability across the, um, I, the sorry, hold on, somebody's at the door. Sorry, continuity across the developmental course. <laughs> sorry again. So the, I don't even remember what I was saying. I've gotten interrupted so many times. I think what I was saying was that the developmental course over the lifetime of disruptive behavior disorders is pretty stable for girls. So there are some major differences between girls and boys. Girls tend to hold grudges for longer, which if we think about it, think of girls, that's probably very true, not just for girls who have disruptive behavior disorders. Boys tend to go through more frequent cycles of conflict and reconciliation so I see this all the time, boys fight, either verbally or physically, and then two days later, they're perfectly fine. However, girls tend to stop their delinquent behavior at a younger age than boys. And let's talk ODD and CD as predictors of later deviance, so that heterotypic continuity. 
There are mixed results. Some studies showed that ODD predicted CD, but others found that children who showed oppositionality did not predict later more severe disruptive behavior disorders that we find in conduct disorder. However, conduct disorder does predict antisocial personality disorder in adulthood. And this is pretty obvious because the DSM criteria states that you actually have to have a diagnosis of conduct disorder before the age of 18 in order to be diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. Violence is more stable over time than theft. Aggression in girls predicts later aggression. Difficult temperament at three predicted conduct disorder in both boys and girls by age 15. A predictor of both adjustment problems in boys and girls at age 12 was prior behavior problems, so that homotypic continuity. The long-term consequences for girls of early disruptive behavior disorders is pretty severe. Neuropsychiatrically, they're impaired. So when we're talking neuropsychiatrically, we're talking about other mental health disorders such as substance abuse. They tend to suffer more violent relationships. This often leads to the inability to care for children and girls who have disruptive behavior disorders as older adults tend to have higher mortality rates. If we look at ODD as a predictor of other outcomes, ODD in adolescence was associated with higher risk for anxiety and depression. So it's interesting that that is found. Yeah, it's kind of contradictory because you would think that ODD would constantly be a predictor of conduct disorder. And here's an important concept that we need to talk about is gender paradox. Gender paradox is that the sex with the lower prevalence rate is at a higher risk for comorbid disorders. So what that's saying, because we talked earlier about how girls tend to have a lower prevalence rate, boys are more prevalent in most mental health disorders, which is interesting because that means that girls are then at a higher risk for other comorbid disorders. So if we have both a boy and a girl who is diagnosed with conduct disorder for say, a girl is gonna be at a higher risk to have more comorbid disorders than boys are. There is an increased rate of almost all other disorders found in women who have a diagnosis of disruptive behavior disorders. So depression, anxiety, all of that. Antisocial personality disorder and alcoholism are three times higher for females who have been convicted for murder. However, the female gender may carry a protective factor against disruptive behavior disorders. So that kind of makes sense. Those behaviors that we talked about in the beginning, those tend and befriend behaviors, those affiliative behaviors, make them less likely to develop disruptive behavior disorders. However, those serious cases, those extremes, do cause more extreme behavior as they get older. So let's talk developmental patterns between CD and ODD. So the progression looks at whether A is a precursor for B. So we talked about this before. Typically, does ODD cause conduct disorder or conversely, does conduct disorder cause ODD? So when we're talking about ODD and CD, 20% of boys and 10% of girls have met criteria for either ODD or CD at least once between the ages of nine and 16. So that's a pretty high percentage of children. Conduct disorder was diagnosed at least once in 8.6% of youth, specifically 3.7% of girls and 13.2% of boys. ODD was diagnosed at least once for 9.7% of youth, 7.8% for girls, and 11.6% for boys. So we can see that ODD is a little bit more prevalent for girls than conduct disorder. So 3.7 for conduct disorder versus 7.8 for ODD. And there is a lower discrepancy um, between ODD for girls and boys than there is between boys and girls with CD. So 3.7 to 13.2 for conduct disorder versus 7.8 and 11.6 for oppositional, design disorder, oppositional defiant disorder. 
Of those who have been diagnosed with conduct disorder, 57% of boys and 46% of girls never met criteria for oppositional defiant disorder. Oppositional defiant disorder only was a pattern for girls. So this leads them to believe, researchers to believe, that in girls especially, ODD is a different dimension of behavior. That authority conflict is a different dimension of behavior that is not really linked to conduct disorder. It starts prior to the age of 12, and it often starts with stubborn behavior, and then it moves to defiance, and then it moves to authority avoidance. So it's a pretty clear delineation of that. If a child was diagnosed with both ODD and CD, most frequently the diagnosis occurred at the same time. After that, ODD came before conduct disorder. But conduct disorder before diagnosis of ODD was very rare. Half of boys and three quarters of girls with oppositional defiant disorder had never met criteria for conduct disorder. And 55% of children diagnosed with conduct disorder have never met criteria for oppositional defiant disorder. So these statistics leads us to believe that the two are less closely related than previously thought. So that aggression and that oppositionality are two very distinct behavior disorders and they're not quite related nearly as much as previously thought. So when we're talking about behavior disorders in girls, there's a covert and an overt pathway. A covert pathway starts prior to age 15, and it's minor covert acts, then property damage, then moderate to serious delinquency. So there's a very clear progression. An overt path and starts with minor aggression, moves to physical fighting, and ends in severe violence. So the pathway for girls, there is some support that oppositional defiant disorder is a pathway to conduct disorder for girls, but not for boys. Irritability starts, so that irritability that is a huge part of oppositional defiant disorder, then leads to aggression in girls. Angry emotionality in girls does lead or is an antecedent for conduct problems and depression in girls who are Caucasian, but not those who are African American. So let's talk developmental types. There's an assumption that involvement in crime diminishes after adolescence and that males are more likely than females to offend at every age. So there's this assumption, but it's also backed up by research. The arrest rates double from 14 to 15 years old. So 14 to 15, when we're talking about disruptive behavior disorders, that's a really key age. And if we think about it, 14 to 15, is typically when a lot of people transition from middle school to high school. It then decreases sharply after late adolescence. The peak age for arrest is 18 to 19 for both boys and girls. The number of girls arrested has increased in the last few years, but the number of males arrested has remained pretty steady. At age 18 to 19, 24 percent of the arrests were girls. So that's a pretty high number. So let's talk developmental trajectories. Oh, we skipped dual taxonomy. Let's go back to that. Dual taxonomy. So we've talked in previous chapters that one of the ways that they categorize early disruptive behavior disorders is either early onset or life course persistent offenders versus adolescent limited offenders. And they have this dual taxonomy for males and they're not sure if it really applies to females. Early onset of disruptive behavior disorders is very rare in girls. However, that adolescent only trajectory, which typically ends after adolescence, doesn't fit for girls either because adolescent girls are more likely to have problems into adulthood, even if their behaviors just started in adolescence. In fact, three to 4% of women started their delinquent careers into adulthood. 
Recent research suggests that this dual taxonomy, this early onset life course persistent versus adolescent onset, may not necessarily be a good fit for males either. Because males show problems into adulthood even if they were in that adolescent trajectory group. Most severe offenders, however, show the strongest relative trend in ending criminality relative to lower frequency offenders. So that's pretty shocking that those who are more severe offenders actually end up quitting their criminality quicker and um, and at a higher rate than those who have less serious behaviors. So let's talk trajectories. Quantitative methods are used to determine which individuals have a higher probability of belonging to one developmental group rather than another. So one story, one story, one study categorized physical aggression as consistently high, moderate desisters, or low desisters, and just low in general. Boys were overrepresented in the higher group, the consistently high aggression, and the moderate desisters of aggression, 54% of boys versus 46% of girls. And they were underrepresented in those low groups, the low desisters and the low, which were 53% girls and 47% boys. Sorry, we have parent-teacher conferences tonight and we're on our two hour break. And I thought this is gonna be perfect. Nobody's gonna stay and nobody's gonna be here. I'm gonna be able to record without any type of interact interruption and <laughs> apparently that is just not the case today. Okay, so boys had higher levels of physical aggression in childhood, but both boys and girls had a similar desistance of that aggression with age. So they ended their aggression as they got older. Indirect aggression is typically something that girls do. So spreading rumors, undermining somebody, it sounds a little bit more like typical teenage girl behavior. There's a persistently low group versus initially high and then increasing. That initially high and then increasing group was 58% girls and 42% boys. And indirect aggression showed a different trend than physical aggression because that actually increased with age instead of decreasing with age like physical aggression. Okay, so let's talk about the explanation of gender differences. There's a bunch of different theories on this. So the first is inhibitory control and temperament. There is a theory that says poor inhibitory control, so poor self-control that's established in childhood is caused by temperamental risk factors and poor parenting that fails to teach that self-control. It's the only explanation that you need for problem behaviors. That's what causes it, period, end of story. That's one theory. Temperament, we know, though, is inherited or it's genetically linked. So if we have parents who are difficult, then you're more likely to have children who are difficult. If you have parents who are easy, then you more have more likely to have children who are easy. And they state that there are two pathways, the BAS and the BIS. And these are the critical ways an individual responds to environmental stimuli that offers rewards or punishments. So the behavioral activation system activates behaviors in response to likely rewards, whereas the behavioral inhibition system activates in response when punishment is indicated. So children with disruptive behavior disorders have difficulty with this. We've talked about it in previous chapters where children who have behavior disorders have difficulty differentiating between when they're gonna get rewarded and when they're gonna get punished. And even when they have learned that they're gonna get rewarded, they revert back to those behaviors that result in punishment. Temperamental tendencies related to problems controlling behavior include poor inhibit inhibitory control, so that poor self-control, a high activity level, so constantly on the go, constantly on the move, greater vulnerability to negative affect and anger. So they're more likely to have a negative affect and they're more likely to be quick to anger. Sensation seeking, that's something we've talked about that's a big risk behavior or big risk factor for disruptive behavior disorders. Boys tend to show higher problems with, than this with girls. Boys are more likely to be off task and identified as hyperactive. So there's a couple of reasons for this. ADHD is higher in boys than girls, but also teacher expectations are a little bit different, 
for boys and girls as well. And as we know, when we're talking about ADHD, boys tend to be um, diagnosed more frequently with the hyperactive, where girls are more often diagnosed with the inattentive. Hormonal contributions also are a factor. Men have 40 to 60 more times testosterone as women do. And testosterone and aggression are linked. There's numerous studies that show that. Boys who develop a criminal record had higher testosterone levels at age 16. So this shows us that gender-based differences are based on neuroendocrinological events and that testosterone does have an effect on aggression. If we look at the curve of the level of testosterone across a male in his lifetime, that also matches the curve for murder across ages. So men tend to commit murder at an age where their aggression, I'm sorry, not where their aggression, where their testosterone levels are higher. And testosterone and serotonin affect aggression in men, but not women. Okay, so let's talk socialization in the family. This is going to be huge when we're talking about gender differences. Antisocial behaviors are due to the interplay between characteristics of children and their environment, such as their family, school, their peers. For both boys and girls, risk factors are the same. Harsh parenting, low socioeconomic status, and parental risk behaviors, such as alcohol abuse, drug abuse. Disruptive behavior disorders are more common for boys and girls with dysfunctional families, families where there's maltreatment, and families where there's a high level of conflict. More girls direct their aggression at family members. We've talked about that previously, specifically their mothers. More seriously delinquent girls than boys come from dysfunctional families. So that's a hint that disruptive behavior disorders, the precursor for that for girls, are more environmental risk factors. Girls within the juvenile justice system have higher levels of family disruption, foster care, multiple fathers, and sexual abuse. Girls are more affected by divorce than boys. So a few years ago, we had somebody come in for one of our staff PD days and present us with um, trauma-based education. So if you ever have the opportunity to do some type of professional development on trauma-informed education, I would highly suggest it. Something that I didn't know, I've been a teacher for 21 years, I've been dealing with mental illness for 21 years, I didn't know that divorce is what they consider the biggest traumatic event for children. I didn't know that. I would have thought that it was some type of physical abuse or sexual abuse. Mother-daughter conflict plays a role in conduct disorder. We've said that before family conflict and more girls aggression is directed at their mothers. Parental punishment and parental warmth are predictive of conduct behavior or conduct problems in girls. Girls are less risk temperamentally, so less of a genetic risk, but they do have a higher risk due to the environment. Harsh discipline and low inhibitory control, so high impulsivity, low fear or shyness is a particular risk Boys experience more physical punishment than girls, but it doesn't factor into the aggression level of either boys or girls. Mothers encourage girls more than boys to be pro-social, so to be friendly, to be nice to everybody, to share, to be concerned with others. Girls are praised for being shy. Teachers tend to give more attention to boys but give girls positive attention for being less active and being dependent. So I teach psychology at Macomb and we're doing our chapter on gender and sexuality. And we just had a huge discussion on this yesterday about the differences between treatment of boys and girls in school and how unfortunately it's still quite a problem. And as you can see by this, girls are praised for being shy and for being quiet. So let's talk peer factors. Intimate peer relationships are more important for girls. Disruptive behavior disorders are associated with difficulty in forming or maintaining peer relationships. So we see that within the actual school eligibility for emotional impairments. That's one of the qualifying criteria is the inability to build or maintain personal relationships. The breakdown of those intimate relationships is associated with crime in girls.
Rejection of peers is particularly associated with the development of conduct disorder, particularly that aggressive part of conduct disorder. Sensitivity to rejection is linked to disruptive behavior disorders, and it's linked to either anger or anxiety, depending on the situation and temperamental factors. Girls are less likely to receive peer approval for bullying. So if you think about like a boy bullying somebody, often the other boys will cheer him on and be like, oh yeah, good job, or they'll join in on the bullying. Girls are less likely to do that. Girls develop language at an earlier age than boys, so they can express their desires and their emotions more easily, which leads to greater self-control and expression of physical aggression. So that makes sense. Girls are a little bit better able to express themselves. That's typically why they use that relational aggression, so spreading rumors and undermining people as opposed to physical aggression. And there are some genetic factors and correlates of CD and ODD. Low noradrenaline and serotonin have been associated with low behavioral inhibition, so that inability to control oneself. Low monamine oxidase levels, we've talked about that in previous chapters, that prevent those breakdowns of neurotransmitters. And the experience of maltreatment, so those two things combined, are associated with antisocial behaviors. So this chapter is a little bit easier to, to understand as we've been moving through the chapters. They've been a little bit less genetic heavy and a little bit easier. I will see you guys next week for next week's lecture.